and uh, and uh, and uh, noisiness and uh, and the lack of the uh, basic civility uh, reminds me of the remark of uh, Tsar Nicholas the First after he told us uh, was reading to his grandson uh, uh, stories of what happened in the French Revolution, and then he finally said, "Now you see why men must be treated like dogs." Uh, that's perhaps extreme. As a matter of fact, I didn't mean that at all. Uh, <laughs> because now it occurs to me that there's an evaluation form <laughs> that some of you uh, maybe uh, have not filled out yet. And I simply wanted to point out that uh, um, um, there'll be a little, little presents uh, for, for all of you at the end uh, from me, personal presents from, from me. Uh, it, was, I, uh, it was really tough getting a hold of as, as many Fabergé eggs as I needed. <laughs> now, we're, c- we're coming to the end of uh, the seminar, and I have to tell you, um, uh, I think that it is, it, is cert- uh, it is certainly one of the best seminars we've ever had. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and um, in, in, fa- in, in fact, uh, I'm not sure exactly when... Uh, we had one that uh, I would put uh, uh, ahead of it. And um, um, many people uh, have told me that they ascribe that to the, to the work of the dean. Uh, but, but that can't be the whole story. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Pat isn't uh, here, but uh, Lou Rockwell is, and uh, I think Jeff is. Is Jeff here? Jeff is not here. But uh, you, you know who's ultimately responsible for this sem- seminar and everything that the Institute does. Now, I'm going to be discussing today the uh, perennial question of the role of the intellectuals. Uh, this is a, 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 a question which has uh, been discussed, especially by, by people from our point of view, for many, many years. Uh, there was an, a great anthology called The Intellectuals, uh, written by a, a, a man who was a friend of uh, Murray Rothbard's, uh, uh, that is collected, George de Hazar. And uh, you'll only find it in, uh, in the used bookstores nowadays, a big anthology. And <coughs> had things by, by Mises, by uh, uh, everywhere from Mises to Stalin. Uh, and uh, George de Hazar was a great guy, explained his principle of selection, which was that anybody who had anything to say against the intellectuals who was included in this anthology which is a, a good principle of selection. The um, uh, issue of the intellectuals has come up very often. You'll find it discussed by mo- in a number of uh, uh, important and good essays in a book that's been mentioned already, uh, edited by Hayek, called uh, uh, Capitalism and the Historians. And uh, the question is, basically, why do the intellectuals act the way they do? Um, I mean, uh, it's no uh, secret um, one of the speakers uh, 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 gave you, uh, do, uh, Dr. Higgs, statistics on the number of Republicans and Democrats, even Republicans, for heaven's sake, um, at the major universities, and you saw what was involved. Uh, uh, one Republican 18 in history departments, 18 Democrats, and on and at the, whatever it was, Cornell or something, Stanford, on and on and on. Now, a... Um, uh, an, uh, one particular free market man who's written about this is Max Hartwell, uh, R.M. Hartwell, uh, an expert on the uh, Industrial Revolution. And uh, he gave a, a very good talk one time at the Montpelier Society. And um, he pointed out that there is, of course, this aversion to, to the free market system on the part of intellectuals. Uh, but... Um, uh, his lecture was especially no- noteworthy for drawing attention to the systematic quality of this hostility, uh, especially as experienced by the typical educated citizen in a Western democracy. Uh, he, he noted that uh, historians against capitalism uh, is only one element, in a ba- as he says, in a battery of self-reinforcing prejudice against private property in the market economy. This is the way a student goes through 
college nowadays. In literature, economics, philosophy, sociology, and other subjects, the student is continually subjected to data and interpretations that converge on a single point, the viciousness of private enterprise and the virtuousness of state intervention and state-supported state labor unions. Uh, and as he says, what, the, what people experience in the universities is then reinforced, of course, by the media, by the cultural establishment, by the churches. Uh, so this question, why this hostility on the part of intellectuals? been a number of theories. Joseph Schumpeter had a famous uh, uh, a theory having to do with the overproduction um, of intellectuals or would-be intellectuals in uh, a capitalist system. There's just too much money spent on higher education. Um, and I'm going to be telling, uh, I've decided I'm going to be telling my students this from now on. What are you doing here? Uh, Bill Gates uh, left Harvard without a degree. Uh, Michael Dell left the University of Texas at Austin without a degree. And, uh, uh, and one could go on and on. So what are you doing here? What they're doing there, actually, is a training for some career that will give them some guaranteed low-level income for the rest of their lives, uh, public school teachers or something of that kind. But we hear from these uh, intellectuals, a never, as, as Schumpeter said, a never-ending condemnation. Um, now, the particular indictment of capitalism, why capitalism is bad or doomed and so on, changes. It changes from, from uh, generation to generation. Uh, it used to be that capitalism cannot uh, provide uh, the, uh, the wage slaves uh, subsistence in their own slavery. That they'll get poorer and poorer, or capitalism creates... Uh, uh, wars among, uh, necessarily among imperialist powers. Um, it cannot compete, when I was a kid, it cannot compete with social, socialist societies in technological progress. That was the line at the end of the, of the 50s, after Sputnik. Um, capitalism promotes automation, as they used to say back then, uh, per, with uh, uh, permanent unemployment. Uh, it both uh, uh, creates a consumer society and its piggish affluence, as um, Galbraith told us, and it also proves incapable of extending this piggishness uh, to the masses, to the underclass. Uh, it oppresses women, racial minorities, that's a, m a more recent um, uh, condemnation. Uh, meretricious uh, popular culture, as the Frankfurt School uh, tells us, and on and on. And Schumpeter says it doesn't matter the specifics of the indictment. What matters is the verdict that the intellectuals have in their pocket from the beginning, and it's a verdict of death. It's a verdict of death on capitalism. So, why? Uh, Hayek had some ideas which I find uh, typically uh, 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 refined and, uh, and benign. He thought the intellectuals uh, 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 judge capitalism in a, uh, uh, to be wrong because of, uh, uh, they have an engineering model of society and uh, capitalism doesn't uh, permit itself to be planned and so on. But I, I would say that uh, probably uh, intellectuals in the humanities are more anti-capitalist than, than, um, uh, than uh, uh, intellectuals in engineering or in, in the sciences. And, um, and, and Hayek also maintained that you have to, the intellectuals, he actually said the, that you, you, you cannot uh, uh, present any kind of orthodoxy to the in intellectuals because that's the one thing that they decline to accept. Um, that was really a blinkered view on Hayek's part. Um, look at the 20th century. With tens and tens of thousands of intellectuals supporting Stalinism, right? Uh, so that uh, 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 Raymond Aron wrote a book in uh, 1957, The Opium of the Intellectuals, about Marxism and Communism. Uh, and it wasn't just uh, the left that intellectuals... Uh, adhere to. When we look at the examples of Martin Heidegger, uh, Robert Brasilak, uh, Giovanni Gentili, uh, Ezra Pound, and so on, who were very attracted to fascism and nas national socialism, I came across a great, uh, I think, a very interesting uh, um, entry in the um, diaries of Golo Mann, who was a German historian and the uh, son of Thomas Mann. Uh, and uh, in his diary of 1933, he wrote, uh, 18th of May, Joseph Goebbels uh, spoke in front of a writer's meeting in the Hotel Kaiserhof. And Goebbels, who was a propaganda minister of the Nazis, as you know, is, uh, 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 Goebbels said, we not, uh, Dr. Goebbels, by the way, uh, uh, actually more of a, of a 
of a right to it than uh, Dr. King. Uh, Goebbels said, we Nazis have been reproached with not being concerned with the intellectuals. That was not necessary for us. We knew quite well, if we first have power, then the intellectuals will come on their own. And uh, um, Goloman wrote in his diary, thunderous applause from the intellectuals. Now, there are uh, uh, various views. Uh, So, Schumpeter's idea then is that um, with the overproduction of uh, college-educated people, um, uh, they uh, can't get jobs they think are commensurate uh, to their uh, to their value. Um, they're they're, uh, they're consumed with uh, resentment and envy. Uh, they see some some businessman or, or businesswoman uh, making a very decent uh, income, and they think to themselves, "Why should they be making this income? They they can't deconstruct William Blake." Uh, and the other things which are desperately demanded on the market. <coughs> uh, so that, but uh, the, the, pro- the real problem is that very successful intellectuals, uh, rich as well as, uh, as famous intellectuals, uh, uh, became socialists. Zola, uh, Gerhard Hauptmann, uh, Brecht, H.G. Uh, Wells, Bernard Shaw, Upton Sinclair, John Dewey in the United States. They were not unemployables. So there's a problem. Now, Mises uh, has, has uh, to my mind, a number of uh, uh, theories uh, about the, um, uh, the root of the uh, anti-capitalistic mentality. Sometimes he says it is because of envy. And he actually, in uh, liberalism, um, uh, does some uh, volunteer psychiatric nosology by, a create, by a, a categorizing uh, a new mental illness, as if the shrinks needed a new one. Uh, called the Fourier complex after the French utopian socialist that, it, that has to do with envy, failure, the loser in life blames the system. Uh, but again, I don't think that that's, uh, that's uh, sufficient considering that, uh, you know, these, these news anchors make whatever, you know, cantaloupe brains make uh, $2 million a year. Um, in an, however, in another essay... Mises has, I think, a a more uh, accurate theory, uh, which is that our whole culture is uh, permeated, in America less than elsewhere, so Europe is really the better example of this, uh, with a contempt for money-making, and this contempt, nurtured and sustained through the centuries under changing regimes, is a natural outgrowth, he says, of of a specific Class morality. It's a, way of, it's a way that a certain class within society sees life and the world. And specifically, it is the morality and way of looking at the world of the classes that are sheltered from the market by the circumstance that they live from taxes. You see, they don't have any appreciation of the market. Uh, they are, of course, professors, uh, as he says, priests, bureaucrats, professors, and army officers. Uh, in our society, professors, but also from the churches. I mean, the uh, Methodist and, and Episcopalian uh, uh, bishops who, uh, who generate uh, and, uh, this, this, this constant stream of rubbish uh, about the economy, uh, right, there's a terrible unemployment in society. Well, the Catholic Council of Bishops will come up with the recommendation, we have to increase the minimum wage. Um, you know, these are people who have no idea of the market. Why, why should they? Uh, and especially professors, uh, why shouldn't everybody just live from a, from a check that comes from some, uh, some, some source somewhere that they have no uh, idea of? Uh, and, and so Mises says, so this class is in control of the, kind of a pre-Gramscian uh, uh, analysis, uh, this class is in control of the ideology of society, and that is what creates this anti-capitalistic uh, mentality. There, are, there is uh, uh, something that should be mentioned here, and that is that um, uh, a certain group of uh, writers, uh, principally uh, George Stigler, right. George Stigler, a great uh, uh, economist and uh, uh, a great. Uh, um, uh, 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 one of the leaders of the Chicago School, he and then Gary Becker and some others came up with the theory, intellectuals and ideology don't mat- matter very much because what matters are individuals acting in their own 
narrow self-interest, and they will then create coalitions according to the public choice uh, way of looking at things, and that's what increases the government little by little, and that's what, what's a, what, a, what accounts for the large government we have. Um, and now, uh, I want to make clear, not only do I get no royalties from sales of Crisis and Leviathan, Professor Higgs doesn't get any royalties since he signed away his uh, rights to it many years ago. So this is not any kind of self-promoting thing as some other speakers have been engaged in it at this <laughs> seminar. But if you, if you want the definitive reply to that and the definitive defense of the idea that ideology is crucial and ideas are crucial, and so that what intellectuals do, for good or bad, is very, very important. Should read the chapter, it's only about, I don't know, 12 or 15 pages, in Crisis and Leviathan, where Professor Higgs deals with that. And really, we see in, the, in, in, a, in a very important historic example the crucial role of ideology, and that was in the rise and fall of Soviet communism. Um, I mean, there's no way of, of uh, explaining Lenin's uh, uh, activity, um, throughout his life on the basis that, that uh, what do you say, future, uh, discounted future flow of uh, income or something. Uh, the idea that somehow, yeah, I'm going get, to get into power and then I'll have everything I need and, and, and uh, uh, all the best uh, uh, caviar and babes and so on. Uh, Lenin was not interested in those sort of things. He was an ascetic. And Lenin created this Bolshevik movement and basically the Bolsheviks. Now, of course, there was a lot of self-interest that, that played into it once they got into power. But they came to power on the basis of ideology. And the Soviet regime, through 70 years, spent enormous amounts of resources on propagating ideology. Um, so that on, on, on Stigler's basis, that uh, 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 you can explain action on the basis solely of immediate self-interest. Well, the general uh, spread of ideology on the, on the part of, these, uh, of, the, of the Soviet authorities over this length of time I think is uh, very significant. And then finally, why did the Soviet regime fall? <coughs> we raised the question before, did it fall because of Reagan's arms buildup? Well, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Higgs that uh, it was in the cards, that, uh, um, and, and, and especially that as the regime was doomed because of the lack of uh, economic calculation, uh, it was basically a third world country with the nuclear weapons. Uh, really, as, uh, as I saw when I w was in Moscow in uh, 1987 and went to uh, a Gums department store, you know, their, their Bloomingdale's, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was not laughable. It was pitiful. It really was pitiful. that uh, uh, there, are people in, there were people in Soweto who had a, an, um, an, an enormously larger range of consumer goods at their disposal, or in, in Jakarta, uh, than, than, than these than the citizens of Moscow, and Moscow, of course, always had the best of what was available in the Soviet Union. Um, so it, it was a, uh, an economic disaster, and then the information revolution came. Uh, and then it wasn't simply the uh, international ballet dancers and chess players and musicians and so on who knew what the West was really like. Everybody got to know what the West was really like. Um, uh, because of, uh, of, uh, of uh, computers, because of the video cassettes, uh, uh, because of all of the methods of, of inf information uh, transmission that uh, became available. And the regime could not withstand that. And Gorbachev tried to somehow reform communism. It didn't work, and they, and, uh, they fell apart. Um, so that uh, uh, the question is, is still, you know, why? Why the intellectuals? Uh, going back to, the, uh, to this uh, idea um, of uh, why they're adversarial to the capitalist system. Now, there was a very interesting book, a fascinating book, written oh, about 15 years ago or so by um, uh, Henry Ashby Turner of the Yale uh, History Department. In those days, it was the best history department in the United States, uh, in my opinion, magnificent history department, and this is uh, big biz German big business and the rise of Hitler. They had for a long time been the uh, notion that big business was responsible for the rise and triumph of the Nazis by uh, bankrolling them, basically. And uh, Turner did a magnificent job of research and, uh, and debunking. 
Uh, but at the end of this book, he's, he uh, raises the question, how come all of these other historians, famous historians, uh, Alan Bullock, uh, uh, Norman Stone, uh, uh, Stuart Hughes of Harvard and so on, and on and on and on, repeated these myths that somehow big business was behind uh, Hitler. And he said uh, sometimes it was because of, um, of uh, distortion, deliberate distortion of the evidence. But that was a small part of the case. The real reason was that they began with a natural bias against business. Uh, as intele intellectuals, as, as academics, they distrusted business, and especially big business. Um, they're willing to accept any story about big business and the terrible machinations and, and uh, their conspiracies against workers and consumers um, because they had no knowledge and, uh, in fact, a deep suspicion uh, and um, animosity towards business. Well, these are professors. And my, uh, 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 what I want to present is the idea that uh, why the media is anti-capitalist, uh, why the, the churches and so on, because ultimately all these people go through higher education, are processed by these anti-business uh, uh, academics. And um, uh, so this, in a way, is, uh, it goes back to what Mises said, uh, that uh, the uh, people who determine uh, the official ideology in the country are people who know nothing about business and in fact, uh, uh, find it very distasteful. Uh, and um, of, um, much could be said about that. Uh, basically, you know, uh, business people, as some of you know, and uh, those, of, uh, those students here who may eventually get a job and make a living uh, will also uh, uh, learn, uh, business people live and die by the market. Uh, uh, they have to respond to the market. They can't, cannot depend on a guaranteed source of income. Now, uh, I, I personally do believe that professors should have a guaranteed source of income, and in fact, lifetime tenure. I mean, that's, that's very important because of the special uh, lofty work that we're engaged in. Uh, during uh, faculty meetings, for instance, we argue about merit increases. You know, I'm going to get an extra $150. No, I'm going to get an extra $150. We uh, argue about dividing up the travel budget. Uh, you'd, be, you'd be, I think, very interested in hearing conversation of professors over lunch. It almost always has to do with their pension plans. The idea that somehow it's a feast of the intellect when <laughs> professors get together. <laughs> Nonetheless, I, I do believe that, uh, that uh, professors are in a special position and should be uh, given this guaranteed uh, uh, lifetime job. Just as I believe very strongly that uh, all of the young people here have a moral ab obligation to pay their social security taxes. <laughs> yeah, really, that's very important. And, uh, um, you know, really, I, I, I want to leave you with that, that bit of wisdom. Um, so, uh, so this is a, a big question why the intellectuals feel this way. And uh, that would be uh, uh, my response. Ultimately, it has to do with the uh, class character um, and in a way, the, uh, 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 in the Marxist sense, the limited uh, consciousness, the limited social consciousness of, of academic intellectuals, because they only exist in a certain spot in society, they don't really see the way the rest of society works because of their own way of life. Uh, so in a way, you, 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 know, you might say you can't hold it against them. On the other hand, it's intellectuals. The intellectuals are the ones who are supposed to have a wider vision and try to see things the way they really are. Uh, they have uh, uh, signally failed with that. Well, since this is our last session, I want to spend a lot more time uh, discussing what you might have to say about it uh, and uh, raise a, 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 a few questions. What do you think accounts for the uh, anti-capitalist mentality in society and especially among intellectuals? Uh, also, you might uh, uh, try to consider and, and offer your own ideas what lies ahead? Uh, are we faced with the uh, rosy Pollyanna future that, uh, that uh, Professor Gottfried has presented? <laughs> in, in, his, in his typical cockeyed optimism? Um, and uh, uh, if it, if it uh, uh, threatens to be darker than that, what can we do about it? Uh, is it possible that somehow 
we are going to be able to change the larger society. Uh, or, instead of trying to change the larger society, I mean, really running against the tide, um, it's not becoming better, it's becoming worse. They, they now say things that they wouldn't have dared say uh, 20, even 20 years ago, let, let alone 40 or 50 years ago, and propose things that, uh, that nobody uh, 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 would have thought of. Uh, so should we try to change the larger society, or should we concentrate our efforts on building smaller communities, as Professor Livingston has suggested? Uh, homeschooling would be a, a, an element of that, for instance. Um, and uh, when the time comes and, and you have uh, kids, uh, I think that's something you really have to uh, consider, uh, and certainly uh, consider uh, removing them from the public schools. And also the, the private schools to a large extent, because they're beginning to emulate the public schools. Catholic schools teach the same uh, ec uh, ecological stuff to, to first graders that uh, the public schools do. A um, friend of mine decided that he and his wife were going to raise their three kids uh, by homeschooling when the oldest child came back from uh, kindergarten and uh, with a list of things to look for in the house. You know, where all the litter was put in the right place and so on. And this was going to be reported back uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as an assignment. Uh, so, should we then concentrate on smaller communities and, uh, and, and, and building up from there? Or what would that mean? Um, and, and also, uh, if um, uh, things are as pessimistic as, uh, as some might claim, what would be the point of a seminar like this? Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, it seems to me obvious that this is the, the sem seminar was a good thing, but then in what way? Um, uh, what will what will what will, will it lead us towards that that is worthwhile? Well, these are some questions, and we have some time, and I'd really appreciate anything you have to say about this. Yes. You wanted to, to, thank you very much. And then yes. the observation, you're blessed, uh, all of you, or many of you at least, who have now embraced uh, the intellectual aspects and some practical applications of the world and the mind as it attaches to libertarian concepts. And among those primordial values you've discovered is ownership of yourself. That's primordial on some philosophic tenets that are clearly defensible. You need now understand, it seems to me, only financial leverage to secure for yourself your future in a way that is not going to be learned, it is not taught, and therefore will not be learned in the colleges and universities of higher education. So ownership of yourself is something with which you gained a certain level of comfort. The fruits of your labor should be always remembered as yours, and there are ways in leverage in the financial community that can assure for you a future of independence from your job in no more than 10 years. If you simply apply the knowledge of leverage in the financial community, you'll be independent of the state, independent of your job. You'll have the means of income flowing to you that gives you a great deal more latitude than the dependency you'll end up with if you don't. So you're blessed to have had a mindset develop over time that precludes intervention in your life by those who otherwise have no interest that's in it. That's, that's a very good suggestion. And I, you're going to be at the um, party tonight? Unfortunately. Not? Unfortunately, I'm a capitalist. I have to get back and earn a living. Oh, you see? <laughs> <laughs> Trade off. But I'm sure that uh, anybody who cared to find out more information could come to you about that. Well, you have the blessing of Nelson Nash up here. All right. Okay, very good. Um, yes? Seems like that leverage ought to get him out of that work this afternoon, but that's another thing. <laughs> but uh, I, I believe that the ideas that, that are generated here are worthy, obviously, and, uh, and should be promulgated through the political process at the county level is one that I, I concentrate on personally. Uh, but th that is very important. The homeschooling you mentioned, mm -hmm. get the ideas into the homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And into that arena, there are a number of uh, homeschooling organizations that are important. 
I'm sure that they'll the glom right on the Austrian concept. Mm -hmm. And it can be taught at, at the lower levels. Okay. Yes? Well, I kind of see the need for some kind of university or something that is controlled by people who are like minded with us, somewhere <coughs> in the United States at least, where at least I feel like I can go. One of the things about this conference has made me realize is that I'm going to have to proceed with caution in my next years in, in college when I learn philosophy and history. And I can, I can learn what someone said, but as far as a perspective, it's all going to have to be in my own. I would like to have some kind of place where I knew that there would be allies or, or something where I could mm -hmm. agree or something like yes. that. Yes. There, there are a couple of colleges like that in, in the United States. <clears throat> they are, in fact, uh, Grove City College and uh, Hillsdale, pretty, pretty good uh, uh, institutions of higher learning. Uh, they don't have the, the, the prestige and reputation of other colleges. Uh, um, it's kind of, kind of a vicious circle, though, isn't it? I mean, how are we going to get a college when uh, the, the whole academic world is tending in the opposite direction? How do you get uh, people in, into positions there and, uh, and so on? Rachel, you have any ideas? <laughs> Help us, Rachel, Rachel. Please. <laughs> Diga me. No, I mean, I think, I, I don't know if I'm quite as negative. Um, Good. Well, first of all, I do think... I hope, I hope, yeah, I hope yeah, so. I think, it's, I think it's important to be constructive and not just negative, like in terms of, you know, yes, we're anti-state, but we also have, as Dr. Livingston's talked about, ideas for communities and <laughs> constructive um, realms of choice for people to live in, overlapping um, realms of authority and so forth. But, um, but I also think, I mean, I think economics um, has, has changed the scene somewhat. For instance, in philosophy, you see people like um, David Gautier, or, and I'm not saying that I agree with him, I'm just saying mm -hmm. that different ec economic views and game theoretic views have, have become respectable, and that's a big change, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. in, terms of, in terms of talking about extremely minimal state. Um, so, you know, Maybe there's, and there's always that one or two conservative people on the, on the faculty everywhere. I mean, you know, he's, it's true, he was saying about the history department, you were saying about the history department, that there's always 29 and 1. You know? Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's something. But there are signs in, in different disciplines like philosophy, you're saying. In, that ca in, the, in the case of philosophy, Bob Nozick's book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, made a big uh, mm -hmm. difference years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when uh, when uh, Bob came to um, uh, to Murray's apartment, Murray Rothbard's apartment, for the first time, began discussing some of these ideas and uh, and so on. Now uh, the thing about uh, Bob Nozick is that uh, uh, he's uh, known as a, uh, a young hotshot at the time, one of the most brilliant uh, younger philosophers. So that his saying these things, which honestly speaking, other people, especially Murray, had been saying before, that made a big difference. And then, you know, Peter Singer was on, one had a big review in the New York Review of books, praising Bob's book. This is really? Yeah, the same Peter Singer, right, before um, uh, he became... That's uh, not since he wants to... Well, what, uh, whatever he's since become. Since he wants to redistribute all our wealth to the third world. I'm a little surprised. Uh, and, and to the animals, and to the animals. <laughs> Don't forget the animals. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Bob Nozick uh, uh, made a big difference there. Um, Actually, uh, the, uh, I can tell you the, the story of it. Bob was a, a very was a social democrat uh, when he entered uh, Princeton Graduate School, and uh, it was my friend uh, Bruce Goldberg, uh, who was in the same entering year in the grad school at Princeton, who you can say converted him, gave him uh, Hayek and Mises to read, and so on. And then Bob went back to his friends at Descent Magazine. Now, if you're not from New York, you've never heard of Descent Magazine. Um, you might remember that there was uh, an early Woody Allen movie, uh, I think it was Bananas, where uh, uh, he's in a, in a magazine shop in New York, and he sees Descent magazine, and he also sees Commentary magazine. And he thinks to himself, it would be a really good idea if those magazines combined, they could call themselves dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Bob went to his friends at Descent magazine, these uh, uh, democratic socialists, and he said, um, um, if the minimum wage is good, why don't we have a minimum wage of $20 an hour? And they couldn't answer that. In other words, they could not answer the first step in the argument. It, it, it was simply a matter of belief, of faith on their part of minimum wage. And that shook his 
his social democratic uh, position, and then he became, at least for a while, a, a, a libertarian. That made a big difference in uh, philosophy, I think. But there was nothing, there's been nothing similar in, uh, in other fields. Well, to the, uh, with the exception of what I s- discussed in my first talk on this new paradigm of uh, the rise of the West based on uh, 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 guarantees for individual rights, especially property rights. But that has not percolated down. I don't think too many people that you've ever heard about it, uh, about that in your in your history courses. No, but it has made again some some difference. So uh, Rachel is on the uh, on the optimistic side, together with uh, Professor Gottfried. Um, <laughs> anybody else uh, have any feelings about this? Yeah, what do you think? I, I'm on the uh, I'm on the optimistic. Side. All right, good. Uh, during the 300 years from prior to World War One, we lived what you folks have been telling us is why things happen for the good. Mm-hmm. But there was no ex- explanation of that to the same extent that has happened in the last 10 or 15 years. So the collectivists were able, with a handful of people, you know, the Fabians, etc., mm-hmm. to replace their values with ours. Mm. Now, if a handful of people is able to have the revolution that they have, what you've done, what you are doing here in mm. educating uh, a large group, we're going to cross out the uh, yeah. American, yeah. Uh, I think is gives gives grounds for some optimism. And I think that whether I think Lou, maybe if he wants to continue on this thing, this is a big enough job for the for the institute. But there should be parallel efforts. Uh, Crisis is coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've been living high on the hog, buying from overseas. They've been taking our checks and putting them in their checkbook and not asking us for the money. Mm-hmm. So at some particular point, there's going to be some crisis. So prior to the, it'll be too late at the time of crisis for us to get any kind of a program. Yeah. So prior to the crisis, we should have a program developed as to what we think should be done to meet that crisis. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, at the local level, uh, I, I personally think uh, that our emphasis should be on educating the state legislators. Now, I don't have any more faith in state legislators than I do in national legislators. Mm-hmm. But state legislators don't have the power, and they've got to compete with big things. So I would stroke them. Mm. I would say, hey, crisis is coming only because you let this federal monster usurp your duties. Well, yeah. And, I get, yeah go know, ahead, please. And then I'd lay out the program. I would, I, I would not be afraid of initiative at the federal level. Yeah. I'd use the word initiative for a change of the, of a, of the Constitution because everybody's afraid of changing the Constitution. Yeah. But, well, and but I, you, you know, I've, I've got some ideas, I'm sure, others, as to what some of those initiatives should be. Yeah. I mean, well, state legis- legislators, I don't know, uh, you, you know, many of them tend to be very venal and uh, um, just uh, the representatives of social of special interests. Yeah. I, I'm, I think of the New York of the New Jersey state legislature, where you can go into the chamber there That's and put. Oh, oh, really? Well, yeah. you can go into the chamber and point out the uh, legislators who belong to the uh, Gambino family and the the ones who belong to the Bonanno family and uh, and uh, other families. Not not, not in the sense of family press. values. They don't have a printing press. They don't have a and printing press. Actually, they're not as, it's possible. As I say, I have no more confidence in them, but they've got to compete yes. against the other states. And possible. In New Jersey right now, there's the gubernatorial uh, election going on that's challenging the... Uh, well, it's possible. It's possible. Anybody have any other comments or, uh, or feelings about this? I mean, it's not that anybody knows what's going to be happening. Uh, yes? But the original premise, I thought, was... How did intellectuals happen to go so far astray? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's not from a miss something of Christianity. From a what? A miss some application of Christianity. Misapplication of Christianity. Well, do you want to explain that, Guy? Well, just the social work, trying to do good for mankind. Yeah. And uh, anyway... Yeah. Yeah. But uh yeah, but uh, Yeah. But as uh, Dr. Woods pointed out that that is a definite um, misapplication and misunderstanding and there was a time when the Christian churches were uh, uh understood. I mean, uh what's what's more obvious than that uh, Jesus never called on the tax collector to to uh, help the poor. But he called on on individuals 
for their own sake and for the uh, sake of the kingdom of heaven and for the sake of the poor to help the poor. What, what, yeah, uh, Daniel. Uh, one of the things is that um, it's very important to distribute uh, publications of the Institute and of other good organizations uh, to the campuses and to students. Uh, I know that the Intercollegiate Studies Institute does a lot of that. And in the past, the Foundation for Economic uh, Education, Happy Dean, did that as well. And I know that Gary North has written some things about uh, how they've done that. And sort of, at first, that might be quite expensive to distribute a lot of literature to college students. But it pays off because if the college students themselves do their part by getting involved, uh, by not only thinking of, of things through for themselves, but also by producing uh, publications on their campuses and things like that. For example, I know that you had the uh, New Individualist Review at the University of Chicago. That really, that, that lifts things up. That, that is what makes um, someone go from just being a sort of passive observer and reader of books to being someone who is actively involved in writing the books and is uh, getting, uh, fighting for the market um, in academia. Mm -hmm. Well, many of you are on college and university campuses. Is this something that uh, could work? Is this something that could make a difference? <coughs> huh? Well, yes. Not to mention op-ed. Op-ed pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Uh, I'm not necessarily on the, on the totally pessimist side, but let me play uh, the devil's advocate for a moment. Um, you know, as, as many bo booklets and pamphlets as, as you want, as, as many op-ed uh, pieces as you want, and all it takes is one uh, phony baloney um, statistic of the sort that has been described here, uh, uh, on the part of uh, uh, Tom Brokow, uh, the, uh, a, a, cons a consumer advocate group has uh, just released a study saying that um, uh, American apples are bad for you. Do you remember the apple thing years ago? Huh? Right. Uh, and it turned out there was nothing to it. What was it about? Well, I mean, I don't know if any study has been made by... My, my uh, I'm, I'm, I'm morally certain what it was about was to uh, destroy uh, uh, confidence in the American food supply and on the people who supply it. That was the point of it. It was, a, it was another attack on the capitalist system. Uh, uh, this was another uh, lie, basically, uh, uh, or about the three million homeless and, uh, and everything else. Uh, all the others. So all it takes is one time on, uh, on, on prime, prime News where 10 million people or 20 million people see it. Um, and uh, or, or, or else take the, the war part, the anti-war part of our position. You know, we can uh, 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 talk all we want. All it takes is this um, Christiana Amanpour on, on CNN. You know her? Yeah. Professional fomenter of war and of, and of, and of, <laughs> of a terror bombing of, uh, of small countries uh, to start talking about some terrible genocide that's occurring in Kosovo or whatever, Right. And then, and then, and the TV does things the way it does. Uh, people talked about movies. I never see movies. But one movie that I did see a number of times over on, on, on cable was uh, Wag the Dog. Uh -huh. If you haven't seen that, okay, you see it. How a war is produced. Uh, the television war is actually produced. Uh, so in other, in other words, I mean, uh, they have control of the media. Do you think that what we can do really can counteract that? What do you feel about that? You think that we can, in some small way, in our own communities, counteract that? You do. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, I think you can, because a lot of times conservative and libertarian organizations don't even take the time to do a press release and send it to the media when they have a meeting. And that's something a lot of times papers are looking for news, and there are a lot of opportunities. And then there was a case recently with Gorbachev out west speaking to some globalist conference where a group of concerned citizens got together, maybe a dozen people, one of them put some money up for a full-page ad in the paper. They passed out flyers at the door. It got into the news. The television picked it up. It became a major controversy, and, and I think the following speaking engagement had to be canceled. So that's a group, an example of how a small group that's active can do something, and that, and that can be done. There's a lot of opportunity that we miss. It's just because we sit back and say, there's nothing we can do. It's all bad. And... Um, the letters to the editor do make a difference, too. People respond, and you respond back. Other people get involved. In the uh, yeah, as far as that goes, you know, uh, every study shows more people read the letters to the editor than read editorials. And make a call, like call C-SPAN, call um, um, CNN, or uh, 
Uh, C-SPAN, you mean? Yeah, C-SPAN. And yeah. I, I did that the other day. And, and well, people in our community were saying, we heard somebody was from Charleston, yeah. and it was me. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was just a small thing. I don't, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but uh, C-SPAN used to just uh, 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 televise the, the, uh, the calls and answer the calls as they came in. Right? I mean, that was, that was the old days a few years ago. Then they changed, and what they do now is you're on the Republican line or the Democratic line or other line. Uh-huh. And the reason for that was that, uh, I don't know if libertarians had more time on their hands or were, unemplo- <laughs> or, or were unemployed or something, but, an, but a very large proportion, a, very, a disproportion, great disproportion of the calls that came in were from libertarians. So they had to change that. And I would suggest if you ever call C-SPAN, call on the Democratic line. <laughs> Why not? I'm a, I'm a Democrat, but, you know, I, I believe a lot of the, what the libertarians say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gabriel. My opinion doesn't count because I'm a 200% optimistic person. Uh, but uh, uh-huh. you can see that, in, for example, about the media, uh, this is a, a good uh, point. For example, in Spain, last year uh, we created um, a web, a web uh, newspaper called L- Digital Liberty, and today it's the most uh, hit on the, the number one on the web. Wow. After, really? after the, the normal newspapers like El País, uh-huh. the one, but it's the number one of the digital newspapers. In Italy, I know that they have also a few new libertarian newspapers, and now all. All of them in the, in the top ranking. How, how did your libertarian website in Spain become so popular? Well, we, we managed to have some of the... It's popular, not that you have special illustrations. Some of the popular or, um, um, radio speakers they wrote for us. and So they spoke about this newspaper in the radio and they started clicking the, the web page. Well, that's certainly hopeful. Some other... Yeah. This turned out to be during the lifetime of everyone here, not the opportunity that we hoped for for a rebirth of liberty. That doesn't make the enterprise any less important or exciting. Uh, I think about the people that I've talked to here and tell me about the times when it was 10 of them getting together in a room with Mises. Uh, Things are certainly better in our situation that we can have a meeting of this size. It doesn't mean that we've won anymore um, in the public, but it doesn't. But I don't think we have to win the war to have it be meaningful, to have it be important, and also to have it be very exciting. If only for the reason that we keep alive the ideas so that some point when uh, the rest of the world is ready for them, this rebirth can happen. And I think you can be just as proud of being in a group that kept the ideas alive as you are about being in a group that was there when the floodgates opened and we had this rebirth. It's very interesting what you say. Uh, I think you can find it on the Fee's uh, website. There was a famous essay by Albert J. Nock, this man we've mentioned a few times, called Isaiah's Job. And and what he says there was, uh, uh, talks about uh, Isaiah the prophet and uh, Isaiah's uh, 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 mandate from God. And it was not to convert the world, but to find the remnant, as he, as he called it, and to keep the remnant going. And the remnant is a minority in every generation, but it's always there. It's always potentially there. Um, well, may, may I ask you if you think that uh, uh, this view of yours, that it doesn't, uh, that ma- uh, that it doesn't ultimately matter, that uh, success comes in one's own lifetime, do you think that's, um, necess- that necessarily has a religious uh, basis to it? It certainly can, I think. Um, but I think that something I heard from Dr. Uh, or Professor Higgs my, my first night here, um, he made the statement that, you know, people have been happy in all times. Um, and people have found meaning in their life. Um, and for some people, it's a religious um, institution or experience that, that provides it. But I, I think it can be philosophical. I think it can have to do with your local community. It can have to do with a group of intellectuals like we have here um, that you derive your support and your meaning from. 
So I think I think it comes from a lot of different um, places. What's important is that um, I think ultimately, all, for all of us, our happiness is going to come out of um, our own life and the life of the people around us that we care about. And that um, a miserable personal life or a miserable life among the people that are important to you um, will drown out any kind of uh, global happiness or liberty or prosperity. So. Very good. Yes? They were talking about pamphlets and sending out pamphlets. There are a lot of available pamphlets on the internet, Mises.org, sure. that they use for the uh, university, Mises University. Sure. <coughs> oh, they're in this whole book, of course. About Twelve of those, and you can always download them, mimograph them, do something with them. Okay, and very. And every, you know, and everybody can do that, whether it's where you are. Sure. Yes. More than you and I together have, yeah. <laughs> the internet's the new TV. Well, maybe the, uh, the thing is to, to uh, concentrate on converting billionaires. <laughs> yes? Christian schools also? Christian schools or any other private schools that you think might be open to that kind of thing mm-hmm. to teach students at the high school level, get yes. them real early into basic sound economics so that they'll mm-hmm. try, try, try to sort of immunize them against the Keynesian onslaught mm-hmm. they might mm-hmm. face in colleges or get them in the frame of mind to go to the kind of college where good economics is taught. Mm-hmm. And this is a good way to start a person out on the right foot. The book is, uh, is available for inspection right here. David, uh, does your book have a title? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> 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 the man has a, has a, ma- uh, a mind like a, like a bear trap. It ha- uh, Introduction to economic reasoning. Right, very good. I've only read a third of it, but it's quite good, what I've read so far. And I think that it's really important to get good economics into the classroom or into the home school. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the private schools, the public schools are hopeless. I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't waste my time unless I really had a real opportunity. Uh, I would uh, I would second I would second your recommendation of that uh, book uh, as much as I have reservations about the author. <laughs> Are there any other comments or questions? Yes. I think there is good fortune to miss the ranks on multiple levels. One is you did convert a million a billionaire, and that's the Koch family. Well, they're right behind them. The witch's dog convention is strong as a bull. And that well, yeah. has supported yeah. citizens of South Economy, which is the largest public asset group. Yes. Yes. Well, a lot, a lot could be said about that. And in, in, in fact, uh, uh, I remember at one time there was some uh, uh, the Koch families, uh, uh, Charles and David, are, are, are quite wealthy, as you uh, know. And at one time there was some talk. What? I don't, not unless it was the past couple of days. No, no, years ago I thought one of the. No, no, no. No there, was, no, there was a big uh, split among the brothers, an old story. But uh, there was at one time some, some talk about them uh, buying NBC. I think it was NBC or maybe ABC. But that, that never panned out, uh, unfortunately. And, uh, if they're, if they're uh, this wealthy and they're really on our page, um, what are their contributions going to? Because I, I'm not aware of it. Yes. They contribute, they contribute uh, uh, somewhat uh, to some free market. Or- Wait a, hold on a second. Wait, wait a minute. Who's the dean? Are you the dean or am I the dean? It's not me. Yes. Very briefly, uh, in the, are there any clubs and colleges, Ponzi's clubs and colleges? 
Well, I don't know. I don't think about Mises clubs. There are um, libertarians. There are libertarian uh, organizations. Yeah. Well, um, we just started the College of Libertarians on our campus last year. We also have a group called the Conservative Leadership Association at Washington University in St. Louis. Dan and I are involved. Dan was one of the founders, and um, we've got a great deal of people in there. And we've been able to have a wide group of conservatives, not just neocons, but in fact, they're in the minority as far as I know. We've been able to do a lot of outreach. We have discussions. We have a a web list where we, we talk about various issues and, and you know, kind of paleo conservative and libertarian talk dominates the mm -hmm. entire debate. That That's another big thing. Yeah, well, we, well, not as much economics, but we talk about politics, philosophy, morality, and things like that. But what Professor Gottfried was talking about before uh, kicks in here, because this uh, thought control, which is becoming more prevalent on campuses, including uh, and not stopping short of violence, for instance, to uh, prevent the uh, conservative uh, uh, speakers from. Uh, from appearing on campuses, uh, that seems to be becoming uh, more widespread. We're known as a heavily armed student. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think we had some uh, good ideas, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the seminar.